it's been a kind of a, the whole journey has been kind of magical, brother. Just, just even how we met, which I talk about once in a while, and today I don't want to take any more time to do, say that again, but it's been a beautiful journey, beautiful place, a great house, beautiful people. I celebrate when I come here, and just even looking out now and seeing some of the faces that uh, we drove by some of your houses and talking about you while we were going, oh, remember you? We celebrate coming here and fellowshipping and being together in a spirit. I'm in Matthew chapter 27, if you want to turn there. And uh, beautiful, Pastor Al was talking about that, that trip to Alaska to just, uh, and April was singing that we've seen your majesty in the creation. Uh, if you've ever seen, just imagine the most glorious picture or video that you've ever seen of the Aurora Borealis. Imagine just some uh, National Geographic show where they've got the most fantastic cameras and waited for however many years to capture the best view of the aurora that you've ever seen in your life. We were standing out there just, I mean, a mob of people just standing out there going, uh, in the middle of nowhere. And it, it was 15 degrees below zero the first week of April, by the way. So, I mean, that wasn't, although I am from Michigan, I, I, I mean, I lost a little of my resistance to that kind of weather. But um, the majesty, to, to, you, you just, you know, Capture the awe of living. You know, we go out to the ocean a lot of times to just sit there and just stare at it. Take it in, man. Live. Get a hold of something and just, just, just sink your teeth into that life. Just like that lion grabs that old zebra, you know. Ah, just grab life and live it. Life is meant to be lived forward. Not looking backwards and complaining about it. And, and honestly, I, I, as I get older, I kind of look back a lot. I look back a lot. And I'm, I'm a little convicted. Just looking back too much. Today, I, I want to talk a little bit about looking forward. Just going out there and living at. That's, that's what I felt like we were doing out there every day. Just, just grabbing a little slice of a little... Chunking up, just cutting off a little slice of life and just savoring it. Every day up there, we did that. Let's get an airplane. Let's get on some snowmobiles. I'm riding around in that snowmobile thinking, man, I just broke my arm in five places, man. And I'm grabbing this machine, and the guy ahead of us is taking off, man. And people are wiping out. My arm is like, I'm, I'm going, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. Get out of there. And then we got across this frozen lake. It's April, and we're going across a lake, you know, and going through these snow drifts, you know, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm just going, man, cut off a slice of life and just savor it. Live it. The young people in here, grab it and live it and do it. I tell my kids this little slogan all the time. Don't ever put your life on hold for your parents' trials. You go through these trials, and you go through these difficulties, and it slows you down, you know. I always tell my kids, don't, don't ever put your life on hold. Listen to me, young man. Don't ever put your life on hold for something that your parents are going through. Ah, man, they're soldiers. They walk right through that fire. They're through a few fires and a few floods. You live that life and grab it. Just grab it. So I want to talk today for a few minutes about the merits of Christ. And it might sound kind of dull on the surface, friend. But this is, the, you know, I've got in, in this pulpit and many pulpits and talked about a lot of things. I've talked about miracles and healing, cancers. I've seen cancers disappear. People don't even believe in God and people that have actually close to physically going to blows. And they see cancers and seen a lot of things. And I want to tell you the truth of the matter is, I'm going to tell you the truth of the matter is that I never did any of those things. I never got anybody filled with the Holy Ghost. I never baptized anybody in the Holy Ghost. I never saved one soul in my entire Christian walk. I've never performed a single healing in my entire life. Jesus did all of that. 
Not one bit of that stuff was done by me. I, I, I say it this way, that God has, in my life and in my ministry, that God has done every essential thing that needed to be done without disappointment. He performed everything, and he gave me the privilege to hold a flashlight once in a while. But this life that I've lived is not based on any degree. It's not based on any merit of my own. I didn't perform anything. I didn't achieve anything. I never arrived anywhere. I'm really not much better. I don't feel much better of a Christian today than the day that I got saved. I've struggled and I've stumbled and I've questioned. I've questioned God. I've questioned my wife. I've questioned my kids. I've questioned myself. I experience everything just like you do. Every, you know, I've been an evangelist, a pastor, a missionary, and, and none of the things that I've seen happen were based on anything that I've ever done. All of it was done by God, and all of it was based upon the merits of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, when he said, I give you my name, all power and authority in heaven and on earth, hallelujah, has been given unto me, therefore go in my name, you will cast out devils. You'll speak with new tongues, you'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. How much of that was based on me? Zero. I want to tell you today about the merits of Jesus. Because the merits of everything that I've done in life, I'll tell you, it's soon to fade away and be forgotten. It's soon to crumble. Every denomination, every church that is built, every organization, Every human institution, every stone that a man lays his hand upon will soon become a crumbling, dusting, archaeological dig site for somebody to try to figure out what happened here. You'll be forgotten. Your tombstone will erode. Your grave you'll turn to dust. And generations that come after you, as it says in Ecclesiastes, will never, not even know who you were. But what Jesus has done is eternal in every work of God will last forever. And not only is the work of God eternal, it continues to grow and unfold. So I don't have a gospel of man to talk to you about today, but a gospel about the power of God and what Jesus Christ has done. Matthew 27, verse 29. It says, When they twisted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, has anybody ever run into any mockers out there when you're talking to people about Jesus? Why should you be surprised? You obviously haven't read the Bible if you're surprised by there being mockers. 38 years of mockers. One guy was mocking one time, mocking away, and we were calling a little service together on a street corner, and he looks at me and he said, he was a Mormon fellow, and he says, uh, can I get up and preach today? And I looked at him, and I said, you are up right after me. Yes, I want you to speak. I want you to get up in the human flesh and in the human arm of what your intellect can deliver, and I want you to stand before the crowd today and show them that we are nothing. I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. I just, all I said was, you're, I told him, I said, you're up right after me. And it was the most dismal day. It was the most boring day. The, the people forgot their little uh, equipment for some show that we were doing. The tape recorder got choked with uh, Mexico dust and went, grr, grr. we turned that on and went, grr, 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 grr. and then I said, that's okay because we got the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hand me that microphone. I grabbed the microphone. The generator's going, brrrr. And I said, we're going to preach the gospel to this crowd, about 100, 150 people there. I grabbed the microphone, and as soon as I started speaking, the generator went, bull, bull, uh. And I look at the people. I said, hang on just a second. One of my guys laughing his head off. Mockers. But I'll tell you what. I said, I don't need no stinking microphone. I don't need no stinking cassette recorder. I don't need no stinking degree. I don't need no stinking program, hallelujah. I, I will give you what I have, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I sat there on that dusty hillside, and I began to preach Jesus Christ. And 150, however many of them were there, they all raised their hand, and they all came forward. And we were down there praying with all these people. And I don't know how long we were praying. We prayed for a long time. His power of God came down on this street corner there. We'd never done a service there before, never done one after. 
And I said, where's that Mormon guy? It's his turn to preach. Gone. The mockers always come in when it's weak and when it looks silly. You know, because the boss of the mockers is Satan himself. So when you see the mockers, just understand where they're coming from. They mocked him. They're mocking him today. They're mocking him in Hollywood. Hail the king of the Jews. Ironic that their confession is that he's the king. They spit on him, just like they do today. I've been spit on. I've been spit on and kicked. <laughs> I don't even want to go through all that. We're not going to talk about my marriage. They spit on him. I took the reed and struck him on the head. And then they mocked him some more. They're never happy continually mocking, and they took the robe off him, put his clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified, and then they came out, and they found a man, Simon, Simon by name, and compelled him to bear the cross, and when they had come to a place called Golgotha, and I, when I first got saved, I thought, Golgotha, wow, you know, the place of a skull. I mean, you know, when you, you just see, like, a skull, and you're just like, oh, you know that Shakespeare play? Oric, Oric, my Oric, you know, I don't know if you're a Shakespeare fan or not, but, I, you know. The skull. You know why they call it the place of the skull? Because that's where birds literally peck the flesh off of the bodies that they executed of the criminals. It's a place in, where they took poor people who weren't afford, couldn't afford a burial and just chucked their body in the garbage dump. Wild dogs and animals. Just, it was the most morbid, sickening place. It's kind of like some of these movies that come out of Hollywood that they put in theater. And you walk in there and you see what's going on in that thing. And you, it's a sickening, of course, we like to dress it up with air conditioning and padded pews, but it's just sick and, and putrid, uh, evil, and, and uh, a, a horrifying, hum humbling debasement of, of the worst element of society. And people go there, just like in the old Western movies, you know, where they go to the hanging. Hey, I've got some barbecued ribs over here that you can enjoy while they're having a the hanging. And Americans are, are as sick and grotesque today as any civilization has ever been, honestly. Just look at our entertainment. Don't want to get into that too much, but you know what I'm saying. The place of the skull. And they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, and he tasted it and he would not drink. Then they crucified him. This is after they beat him and, and mocked him and put the crown of thorns on him, scourged him, which they used to call that the, the mini-crucifixion. The little crucifixion, the scourging. Divided his garments and cast lots. Stripped him naked and, and hung him on a cross. And that this might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet. They did, divided my garments and among them for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. There they are, just gawking. Now on top of the mockers, we got gawkers. Mockers and gawkers. And then they put this inscription over his head. This is Jesus, the king. And, and it just... Funny how they do all this? He's still doing it, just like this. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. And those who passed by, blaspheming, we got it, blaspheming, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Save yourself if you're the son of God. Come down from the cross. You're hanging on the cross and he's up there dying for their sins. Come down from the cross. If they knew what they were saying, they wouldn't be asking him to come down. And then on top of that, look what, verse 41. And on top of that, the chief priests also mocking. There it is, mocking. Just keep saying this, mocking in the scribes and the elders. On top of the world and Hollywood and pagans and heathen people and atheists that have rejected God, on top of all those people taking the crucifixion out of the gospel and mocking every element, now we've got the religious people. When the pastors and the religious people, and we have a lot of this in America today like never before, religious mockers. You know you're really down there when the religious mockers come out. Because when you can get a couple pastors to get in there and say that the grace doesn't really matter, that it's just everybody's already saved and it doesn't matter. You know, if it didn't matter, if it didn't matter, he wouldn't have sent his son to die on that cross. You know, I've got a son, and I don't think I'd let him die for you. That's hard. That's a hard question to ask a father. And if I sent him out to die, and he had to die some kind of horrible death, and he had to descend and humble himself from the status of life that he enjoys in peace and love and unity of his family and be beat and mocked by, by foul people, 
And then some guy who calls himself a representative of me says that that doesn't even matter, that that was just symbolic. I'd be torched. But, you know, I'm not going to speak for God on that, on that occasion and see how he feels about it. But I do know this. I don't want to be an enemy of the cross, as it says in Philippians. I'm watching what God is doing on the earth. I'm not talking about what man is doing on the earth. I'm watching what God is doing on the earth. And then I watch how men react. And you get the religious people in there mocking also. I've been mocked by religious people. I remember I was traveling with an evangelist one time and we were doing some outreaches and I was getting shot at. The churches were shooting at me pretty good, you know. And he looked at me and he goes, I've taken a couple arrows. No, he said, I've taken a lot of, uh, I've taken a lot of arrows in the, in the back for preaching the gospel. And he said, and once in a while, it's not from a so-called Christian. He said, the heathens love you, Lee. The unbelievers and the, the blasphemers, they love you and the church is angry with you. The, the priests gather together and join the mockers. Here's what they said. He saved others himself. He cannot save. If, if he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and then we'll believe him. Well, let me give you a little education on faith here, okay? I want you to understand faith so that you can walk with faith. I don't want you to wait till my, you're my age to where you start getting a, a handle on this. All my life, I want to know everything. I want, I'm just curious about everything since I was born. And I just read books and just constantly study. And to this day, I can't stop. I just love to do it, so I do it. Also, if I just kind of try to let go and not study stuff, my mind's like one of those wood chippers from, the, from the, you know, the, the grinders for the tree trimming companies. When it's sitting there without anything in it, it's going, wah! And so I just grab a log and throw it in there once in a while. I just want to know. I just want to study stuff. I want to I learn things, you know? And so I want to know why. And I want to know how. And I want to understand. And these are my questions to God that I've had for 38 years as a Christian. Why, how, government, politics, conspiracies, right and wrong, and the human nature, the evil that dwells within us, within me. But questions about the human psyche and the human spirit and the human soul and destiny and the, the development of nations and the course, the trajectory of things that go beyond a human lifespan of 70 or 80 years. But we go through cycles that last four or 500 years. We go through cycles that last 1,000 years. The entire course of human history is like an arrow flying through time. Like a, like a go landing on something. Where? How? What? I don't understand God. And this I have learned, that faith will precede understanding by many, many years oftentimes. First, you believe. You don't put conditions on God and say, if you show me this, then I will believe. That tells me that you won't believe in him if he raised somebody from the dead right there. Faith precedes the understanding of all things. And if you did understand half of the things in the universe, which you don't and nobody does and nobody ever will, you're still going to have to believe God to walk through the other half. So you might as well just get it into your noggin right now that the key to walking with Christ is not challenging him to produce something with a condition that then you're going to believe. He's commanded us to believe. He's commanded us to trust in him. That means to rely on him, to lean on him. I don't understand. Hebrews 11 says, by faith we understand. There's another verse that says, faith, a, a rooted and grounded dependence and relationship with the Father precedes understanding, and it also yields an understanding that other people will not acquire who do not have faith. Oh, show me this miracle. Have you ever run into one of those people? Show me this miracle, and then we will believe. We'll do what you say, but first you do what we want. Forget it. You're going to be waiting a long time. And I know that because at the end of the story, you see these miracles that happened. It didn't convert every single one of them. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he'll have him, for he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were with him crucified reviled him in the same thing. I mean, that's pretty pathetic when you're you know, crucified and you're mocking the guy that's crucified next to you. And from the sixth hour, now it says in verse 45, it says, now, now. See, there was then. God will let this whole stretch of time go by where everything looks impossible. And then it says this. 
I love the way he wrote this in there. Now. I like living in the now. I like being there in the now. If you want to be there in the moment, if you want to be there when the power comes down, if you want to be there when God's about to do his work, you might have to walk through the valley to get to the place of the skull. You might have to put up with some mockers. Don't get up and just answer all those fools according to their folly. Don't get up and just study and try to understand. Don't fall into the same ditch that they fell into, trying to understand everything. You walk into that situation, just hold back for a second and just let God be God. It looks hopeless. You're surrounded by atheists. You're surrounded by mockers. You're surrounded by worldly people. And then it says, and then now. Book of Acts chapter 2, it says, then suddenly. If you want to be there in the right attitude, I'll tell you, I've seen when the power of God came down and it was so glorious, I said, I'm so glad I'm a Christian right now. Now, about the ninth hour, it says there was darkness all over the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. That's from about noon till three o'clock in the afternoon. And the sky just grew black. Sometimes in Michigan, we'd have thunderstorms, man. And I mean, and tornadoes, tornadoes, man. I used to go out and chase them. I used to go out and I would ride around at night and, and into these thunderstorms. And even in the daytime, sometimes the sky would just turn black. And you could just sense that something was going to happen, man. I climbed a lot of mountains, a few mountains in my, in my time. And you, you talk with a lot of mountain climbers. Some of them been struck by lightning or they've been on the mountain when lightning strikes. I climbed Half Dome and there's a sign on Half Dome that says lightning strikes Half Dome every single month of the year. Hundreds of times or thousands of times that a lightning bolt comes down on Half Dome and strikes it. And I was reading an account of five guys that went on Half Dome, one solid chunk of granite, and they were standing up there. And I also had this, the pleasure of talking some, with some guys that were on the Grand Teton when, it, when lightning hit it. And when you're standing there on a mountain, before lightning strikes, the, the charges of the ions in the earth are building up, positive and negative, uh, one above and one below. And so you're in a charged area. And as that happens, what happens, these ions, these electrical charged ions, they're trading electrons off, and they're preparing. There's a huge surge of electrons that are building on the surface of the earth and a deficit of electrons in the sky. And as that happens, what it does is it ionizes your hair. So have you ever taken a balloon and gone like that, and it, it creates like a static charge? Because electricity, a static electricity is basically what a lightning bolt is, is static electricity. And when you do that, you go like that, and your hair kind of stands out like that. You know what I'm saying? Well, you're on a granite mountain. It's not a balloon. This is a, a five, a, a 1,000 foot tall granite balloon that is charging ions through that granite piece and it's surging up to the top. And you're standing within a 50 foot radius of where that lightning bolt is going to strike. And as these ions begin to pile up, your hair just ionizes and goes poof and sticks straight out. Climbers will tell you when that happens, dive somewhere. <laughs> But where do you go? You've got nowhere to go. And you're standing on Half Dome. You're, you're, you're 5,000 feet above the valley floor. You're right off a 750-foot cliff off the front. And this backside is just as bad. If you tumble down it, you're going to die. And you're standing on top of this thing, and your hair just goes poof, like an afro. And that's... What it feels like when you're standing there about the second that God is about to do something powerful. You're sitting there, man, and you can't get your hair all done. You got your thoughts, you got your mascara on, you got your swagger, you walking into church, and then all of a sudden, you didn't know this was gonna happen. But God is charging the spiritual ionic particles of his kingdom. And there's people out there mocking, if God is out there, then let him strike me with a lightning bolt. They don't have got no, brother, nobody that stood under a lightning bolt has ever spoke those words after they came out of that alive. The sky grew black. God was about to do something, man. And I would have loved to see their little faces when their hair went into afros. Poof. 
you know, my God, go ahead. I tell them, my God, all that does is just crank the generator up even more. Go ahead, you scoffers, scoff your faces off. God's about to do something powerful. Sky was back. And so Jesus, he pushes up on the nail and he screams, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He's talking in Aramaic and nobody even knows what the heck he's saying because most of this little village language dialect off to the side. Why in the world would he even say such a thing? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I honestly haven't heard a good explanation. I've heard a lot of pat answers for that. Okay, but not from guys that have had their backs tore off and nails through their feet and they're about to die and they're screaming out, from bursting from their insides, screaming out. Something profound, and I don't have time to even get in it, what I've experienced in that verse, but it, that in itself has drawn me into the majesty of Christ. Some of those who stood by, they heard it and they said, this man's calling for Elijah. Let's get some vinegar and stick it in his mouth. And the rest of them said, let him alone. We'll see if I, Elijah comes. Let's just stare at him some more. And then he cries out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. I believe this is when Jesus cried out and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. This thing was 30 feet wide and 30 feet high. That's about the height of the gymnasium. Imagine a curtain made of rope. The traditions were that Josephus, the Jewish historian, said they, the ceremony to raise that curtain was 400 men. And they would, probably more than they needed, but, it, but a, a curtain the size of that gymnasium, not made out of silk, made out of ropes, cords, woven together in a giant fabric. And it ripped, and it didn't rip from the bottom, it ripped from the top. Their hair went poof, the veil went crack. I love the scene in their faces. The earth quaked. Yeah, the mockers can mock, but when the earth starts shaking, you know, in California, the earth is shaking and people are going like this. Down in, down in Southern Cal, they'll go, this is what they do. They'll, they'll be sitting there drinking their pina colada and the earth is shaking. The fan, ceiling fans and the chandeliers are going like this and they'll go, and this is probably in the church too, by the way, but I'm not going to. Okay, anyways, so the, the earth. It's probably a 3.7. Would you say that's a 3.7? But let me tell you what, when the granite rocks begin to split down the middle, all them bunch of sissies start diving under stuff. That's not a 3.7! <laughs> they act like they're brave till the rocks split. And then look at this in verse 52. I mean, I've, been, I've read this in the Bible the first time, and I said, well, how'd that get in there? I didn't see that before. It says, the grave were opened, and many of the body of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So in the time frame here that I'm looking at, the rocks split and the graves were opened, but the saints didn't resurrect until after the resurrection because Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. So I'm trying to piece this together here, and what I see is when the earth shook, when a lightning bolt hit, when the power of God arced, can you see this, friends? That, that we, we challenged God, the world challenged God, but there is a power in heaven that surged down upon this earth, and the graves opened up, and their dead bodies, I could see the old bony fingers of Elisha sticking out there in one of them graves, just, ah, morbid. I mean, you know, and, and those people... Listen, if that happened, you wouldn't be running around touching those graves. Three days later, those people came alive. Could you imagine being the groundskeeper down at the cemetery and you're just going to, I'm not going to mow over on that side for a while because, you know, these things are, arms sticking out of there, look like the zombie apocalypse is about to happen. And then these people rose from the dead and showed themselves alive. I mean, can you imagine the guy that was out there, somebody out there putting some flowers on a grave? Joseph pops out of the grave. First, his bony arm been hanging there for three days. And then all of a sudden, he stands up, shining white garments. I'm Joseph. 
Oh, man. And the centurion rose with him. Verse 54 says the centurion, this is the guy that crucified Jesus. This is the guy with Jesus' blood on his hands. He saw the earthquake and the things that had happened. And he feared greatly and he said, truly this was the Son of God. Peter said it this way in 2 Peter 1 and 16. He said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. And that's what we're accused of. That's what he was accused of. The Greek word fable is myths. I mean, every time you heard that, religion is a myth. Peter said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we declared unto you the power of God and the power of his coming. Well, what coming is he talking about? The coming of Jesus to the earth. We sat in darkness when a great light appeared in our generation. We saw the power of a lightning bolt of God strike the earth. The shock waves echoed through the land. He said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Oh, all the time, these worship leaders are, you know, under so much pressure to get people to worship. We feel like we're, we're like little uh, marionette puppets out there trying to put on a good show. Maybe people will love the, 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 the song, and then we compete with the church down the street who's got disco balls and laser shows, and I'm personally waiting for the pyrotechnics. I don't know why I love bombs when they go off, and put some bombs in the church if you want to entertain people. I did that in Ensenada. I put some bombs on the stage. I, I, you can buy bombs down there, whatever size you want. I actually, it, did, it didn't draw people. It actually, it actually emptied out the first couple rows. But I like bombs. But you know what? That, that, that you don't have to entertain a man who has been an eyewitness of the majesty of Jesus Christ. This man went from zero to hero in 15 seconds. This man went from nothing. He went from the pit to the pulpit in 15 seconds. You don't have to sit there and dangle some kind of treat out in front of a Christian to, to fall in love with Jesus. We're always trying to, to con people or come up with a clever way of saying something. That's not what I do. I just declare the gospel. Paul said this gospel, I'm not ashamed of it because it is the power of God. And I've preached the gospel for 38 years. And I've seen on the streets, and I've seen in the pulpits, and I've seen even people in churches getting saved. I've seen lives changed. I've seen things happen. And it is the power of God. And those people that are saved, those people who are eyewitnesses of that majesty, they're not running around talking about what they've done. They're running around like that blind man said, on account of him. That's our story. Truly, this was the Son of God. That'll get your hands in the air. The cross hit the earth, and it was like a shock wave that continues across the earth even today. When God created the earth, it says in six days he created the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. He's not creating more cows. Where are all these cows coming from? Where are all these trees coming from? Where are all these people coming from? We think that we can just go to Mars and colonize Mars. I'm telling you, it's going to be disappointing. God went like this, boom, and he created a shock wave, and there's been 10,000 years of wildlife that you could look at and just enjoy. There's been 10,000 years or 100, I don't know, of, of trees and lakes and mountains and streams. It continues. When God strikes the earth with a miracle, it doesn't stop unfolding forever. And when Jesus Christ died on that cross, that was a miracle that he did at Calvary. And he doesn't have to do that miracle one more time because that miracle traveled. And he said, this will go through all the earth. And it did. There's not a nation on this planet that hasn't been rocked by the gospel of Jesus Christ. 